Hello and welcome to this edition of World Talks. I'm Anna Kalczynska. Today marks 1,000 days since the start of Russian full-scale aggression against Ukraine. Two and a half years since the invasion of the Ukrainian defenders stand unwavering in their determination, uh, yet less and less certain as to the outcome of the war. And joining me now in uh, trying to assess the potential situation of Ukraine and the effort of the West regarding the military and financial support is Benjamin L. Schmidt, senior fellow from University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Hello and welcome. Hi, good to be here. Good to have you. Okay, so ever since the beginning of the war, the US stuck to its principle, the doctrine of not allowing Ukrainians to strike far in the Russian territory. On multiple occasions, Jack Sullivan uh, declined publicly to grant Ukraine the permission to use its long-range missiles. So um, many consider this a strategic mistake by the West. How about you? It was absolutely a strategic mistake by the West, Anna. And, and frankly, Jake Sullivan's policy of being one step behind the military uh, reality on the ground has condemned a lot of Ukrainian uh, civilians and, and military personnel uh, to, uh, to, to their demise because we've always been in what I call an X minus one uh, policy, where X is whatever policy that we need, whether it be on uh, military support or sanctions against the Russian Federation. And we're always at an X minus one. And oftentimes this is the United States or in particular, uh, you know, Jake Sullivan and, and the Biden White House aligning themselves with Olaf Scholz and, and the, the, uh, you know, the, the so-called escalation managers uh, of, of the transatlantic community. And unfortunately, those that know a lot more about living uh, on the border of uh, the Russian Federation across Central and Eastern Europe uh, and, and have that historic experience uh, living under uh, the Russian boot during the Soviet era, um, they knew more. They knew what was going on. They knew how to deter Russia. They know how to push back on Russia. And this, I mean, the Baltic states, Poland, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, Romania, et cetera. So I think that the big lesson here is we need to listen more and more to voices uh, along NATO's eastern flank because they, frankly, understand the threat and also the policies needed to push back on that threat. So misunderstanding the threat, you say. But besides that, what are the main sins of the West as uh, to supporting Ukraine? Well, I mean, we've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, frankly, this, this notion of standing with Ukraine for, quote unquote, as long as it takes, that's all well and good uh, from, a, you know, a, a, an aspirational principle. But it also, there is a military reality that you need to help Ukraine win as quickly as possible uh, because uh, its, it's uh, civilian population has been decimated by attacks, its, its energy infrastructure, its, its, its critical infrastructure has been decimated by attacks. And this means that every stage of the war in which we have been reticent to provide Ukraine with the, the military system that it needs within reason um, has been behind. We've also not maximized our sanctions potential or technology export controls potential against Putin's Kremlin. Uh, the, the oil price cap is a good example of this in which some European countries were calling for a total blockade of, of Russian oil, but instead the United States and, and uh, Germany, but in particular the United States, pushed back on this. And ultimately what we got was a oil price cap instead of an oil sanction. They set it at $60 per barrel for, for Russian Urals crude grade oil. And this was supposed to come down you know, over time, you know, maybe once a month or something like that be revisited. I know that, that officials in Poland and in, in Estonia in particular were calling for this. Well, guess what? It's been over two years and that price cap has been the same ever since. And, and it doesn't matter whether the oil was trading above the price cap or below. And right now it's still trading below, meaning the oil price cap is doing absolutely nothing. Um, Poland has called for some time for this to be reduced closer to the marginal cost of production of that oil around uh, you know twenty nine to thirty one dollars per barrel, um, and and it hasn't happened. So my goodness, it's been you know a thousand days of this war, and we've learned almost no lessons in terms of how to actually deter Russian aggression. 
That's harsh opinion. But with Olaf Scholz lagging behind the transfer of tourist missiles, for instance, but not only him, the many European countries plunged into internal problems, like France, for instance. So do you think, do you, do you consider it's possible um, for the West, for the Western European countries, to unite around one commander-in-chief, for instance, or um, to make the relations with, uh, with Kiev uh, a single-handed uh, policy? Well, look, I mean, I think that there's there's some reticence uh, and there has been uh, in the Biden administration to lead from the front in terms of the transatlantic community. It's it's a full consensus approach. And, and I understand the, the need for that, especially in the NATO context. But but, you know, aspirationally, I think the United States has an opportunity and, and has uh, has not been able to lead as much as it could have to push in particular reticent countries in Western Europe like Germany to increase their support. Uh, the fact that Olaf Scholz, even now, even with the United States, France, the UK and others allowing for longer range strikes uh, against the facilities that are launching these horrific strikes against Ukraine inside of the Russian Federation, uh, Germany's Olaf Scholz still says no, Taurus, uh, Taurus missiles not allowed to be used in Ukraine whatsoever. And that is basically a, a dogma that he is stuck to, unfortunately, um, regardless of the military situation on the ground. So we really need, again, NATO to continue to lead on this effort uh, so that we can we can put more pressure on countries that are, are underperforming. Uh, and, uh, you know, we may see that uh, Friedrich Mertz, uh, as he is projected to possibly win the chancellery, has said that he's going to give Putin an ultimatum, either get out of Ukraine or 24 hours later, the Taurus missiles will be approved. I think that's a prudent approach. This is the sort of thing that, that Putin needs to hear, that he's actually going to be met with strength uh, rather than indecision and dithering, which is, of course, what we've seen over the past 1,000 days. Benjamin, let's discuss the coalition of the willing, if you may, the, the willing to... Um, willing states to secure Ukraine and to deter further Russian aggression. So do you think that um, such a list consisted of Poland, Baltic states, the Nordic countries, and, um, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, France, Canada? What is the potential for such an alliance? I think, I think that de facto that has been the alliance that has been leading uh, to a great extent, in addition to the United States, to, to support Ukrainian defense from day one. Again, uh, uh, these are countries that really are clear-eyed about the threat that, that Russia poses. They understand uh, what what Putin's up to, what this Kremlin is is up to uh, when it comes to Ukraine, and and also with re regard to attacks against the West more broadly. We continue to see sabotage operations across Europe, as in particular Northern Europe, whether it be in the offshore uh, or the onshore, against energy infrastructure, against telecommunications, against transportation lines. And in particular, in Poland, the Czech Republic, the UK, and France, we have seen uh, attribution against either Russian nationals, Russian you know, government-backed actors, or uh, those from other third-party countries, whether it be Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, Czech Republic, et cetera, that have been hired via telegram from the, the Russian military intelligence, the GRU, to carry out sabotage operations against the West. This is all part of a total warfare uh, multispectral campaign that, that Russia has been pushing for some time. And, and I think that we call this hybrid warfare, but but in fact, uh, I've heard uh, uh, Gabrielis Lenzburgis, the foreign minister of, of Lithuania, recently say that this you know pro probably should be called terrorism. And the only reason it's not called terrorism is because if it was called terrorism, our leaders would have to respond because our electorates understand what we do to push back on terrorism, it's not so clear what we do to push back on these kind of, uh, uh, you know, you know, gray zone threats or hybrid threats, uh, as we are calling them right now. So I think there there has to be more political pressure on our leaders to uh, to do more to lead against uh, Russian aggression. How can the recent uh, permission by Joe Biden to strike Russia deep inside on their soil impact the situation of the war? I mean, I think it's it's absolutely uh, critical that this, ha I mean, this should have been done long, long ago. I testified before U.S. Congress in September of this year and called on this specifically because of the, the extent of damage in particular uh, that Russia has inflicted and continues to inflict against Russian, oh, sorry, against the uh, Ukrainian uh, energy system, right? You have to remember that there's something like 80% of thermal power capacity has been disrupted 50% of electricity grids have been disrupted there's there's a high amount of this 
uh, 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 energy infrastructure damage going on and to rebuild a country uh, you know, of, 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 uh, full of energy infrastructure, the scale of Ukraine is going to be astronomical in terms of the price to the transatlantic community uh, uh, you know, compared to what we're, what we're seeing uh, with just defending the existing infrastructure. And as it is, this is a cumulative effect. This isn't something that happens before each winter and then Ukraine has been able to fully rebuild its energy infrastructure. No, this takes years. Uh, of time to rebuild, and as a result, we're seeing a cumulative of, uh, impact. Where I think this uh, this winter um, is going to be the uh, harshest, and, and frankly, uh, the most uh, uh, you know uh, you know most uh, um, you know widespread humanitarian nightmare for Ukrainian citizens to date. Uh, and and unfortunately, that's a lot of that's on us for not allowing and providing the um, the air defense that that should have gone in a long time ago. Uh, to protect these infrastructure sites. Of course, you can't protect everything, but you can certainly increase compared to what we've been doing um, to support uh, the Ukrainian people and, and to ease uh, to some extent. Again, that's only marginal ease, but ease their humanitarian suffering uh, to some extent. Um, you spoke about uh, testifying in, in front of the Congress, so you certainly must have been confronted with a retaliation scenario, right? Uh, many people asked you uh, about that. So now comes a response by Vladimir Putin today to change the nuclear doctrine. Um, so um, setting new conditions under which the, the country would consider using its arsenal. Putin has been warning the West on many occasions, right? Um, telling them that NATO would enter the conflict directly, last time this September even. So what risks do you think that poses to the country bordering Russia and Ukraine? I mean, specifically Poland or the Baltics? Well, look, I mean, Putin has, has said these remarks since before, uh, uh, you know, before Russia's large scale invasion of Ukraine. Of course, Russia has been invading Ukraine, whether it be the illegal annexation of Crimea or the, uh, the, the, the war that it led in, in Donbass since 2014. And so, I mean, we really have to remember that part and parcel to Russia's multispectral threat pattern, whether, it be, whether it's directly connected or not to uh, its uh, large scale war in Ukraine, is that it uses disinformation to try to intimidate and deter uh, the West from supporting uh, those sort of measures that would push back on Russian aggression, uh, on Russian, um, you know, uh, economic projects, things like Nord Stream 2, to push back on strategic corruption and elite capture, where, where Russia has hired former senior uh, uh, Western officials after leaving the public trust to, to work for Russian state-owned enterprises. All of these sort of things operate together, okay? And, and it's, it's nuclear threats are part of that. They, they absolutely are saying these kind of ambiguous nuclear threats in order to deter or, or at least give top cover to those in the West that want to either, uh, you know, give up support on Ukraine and, and not support, uh, uh, you know, Eastern European uh, security um, or else simply uh, are actually in favor of the Kremlin in some way. And, and there's certainly a lot of officials that, that seem to be uh, on the side of Putin's Kremlin. And so uh, this messaging is kind of a, a dog whistle to those folks uh, on, on, uh, on the Russian side of the issue, let's say, across the West, to use this as, as an argument to stop supporting Ukraine. And we absolutely can't. We can't give in to nuclear blackmail, or else this will continue to undermine all of the, the liberal democratic order that we've built since the, the Second World War uh, globally, and, and that is way too dangerous if we care about our uh, our democracies across the West in this way. All right, thank you very much, Benjamin L. Schmidt, for your insights and expertise. It was a pleasure to have you and to talk to you uh, this evening. And that completes this edition of Evening Talks, but please do stay with us for more as the news continues here on TVP World. Thank you very much for watching.